Chad must be understood in the context of the history of the former French colonies. In 1958, when uh, Charles de Gaulle became the president of France and the wave of independence has started, he allowed the former French colonies to vote either yes or no, to remain within the effective control of France by voting yes or voting no and gain independence and be outside of the control of France. And of course, Guinea and Algeria were quite clear and took a clear decision. When therefore Chad regained uh, independence under the leadership of Francois Tombalbay, it was a new beginning, but French dominance was still alive and well. And I remember at one time during the 1970s when there was the desire, early 70s, to move away from uh, colonial names and other things, Francois Tombalbay became Ngata Tombalbay. But he was uh, an erratic character, and uh, his dalliance with the French, of course, uh, did not last long, and in 1975, he was overthrown. But that did not take away the fact that the French were still in control, so that when the Balbai government is overthrown and Felix Maloum comes in, the French are once again firmly in control, and later, of course, when F Felix Maloum was overthrown, we had the administration of Gokuni Wede. And after Gokuni Wede, we had the major conflict between Gokuni Wede forces and Hissen Habre forces. Ultimately, we know that Hissen Habre was tried for conducting affairs that were contrary to human rights and was actually jailed. And of course, after that, we had uh, Debi administration. And after Debi's death, his son, Mohammed, is now uh, the effective ruler and has declared that he wants to contest the presidency. So these conflicts are born out of many contradictions. Contradictions born out of individuals who still want to be under the control of the French. And it must be remembered that even as we speak now in the year 2024, the French look at Chad, Chad very differently. Many of the forces that were expelled from Mali, Niger, Burkina Faso have relocated to Chad. And the recent conflict in the month of February that saw the death of the socialist leader in Jamena must therefore be seen in the context of the unseen hand of France trying to remain in effective control of Chad and therefore not allowing somebody that they do not control or somebody that they do not understand to become the president of Chad. And my view is that Mohammed is seen as somebody who will do France's bidding. And this is the last point for France in the Sahelian region, and they are going to fight for it. Remember, they have lost Guinea, they have lost Mali, they have lost Niger, they have lost Burkina Faso. They are going to fight for Chad. That, in my view, is the brief history and the circumstances surrounding the current Chadian situation. France is in the same station as the former colonial powers, whether it's the United Kingdom or Spain or France itself. These are former colonizers that are losing their grip. They are losing their sources of income. They are trying to be relevant in the modern day political chessboard. And therefore, when you see them doing the things that they are doing, making noise, you've seen, for example, President Macron say that we must win in Ukraine. We cannot allow the Russians to win. We are going to make sure that they are defeated. A very unfortunate statement, if you ask me. 
if, if you say that this is a conflict between Ukraine and Russia and a foreign power which has a very dark historical past is saying we must win, it tells you that this is a proxy war. And, and these are the kicks of a dying horse. And you can see France is dying in many places in the world, not literally, but in terms of losing her political grip, in terms of losing her economic grip. And that is in itself indicative of a system that has too many internal contradictions. And those contradictions are beginning to undermine their confidence so that even when they talk about Ukraine, they are also scrambling to retain their power in the Sahelian region, and they are losing it. There is even anecdotal evidence that some of the insurgencies that you now see in Burkina Faso, the insurgencies you see in Mali, in Guinea, are actually financed at the behest of France. And when they see a country like Chad uh, continuing to behave as if it were a neo-colony, then they like it and they are going to do everything to protect her for their benefit. Africa finds herself in a very interesting situation as we speak. And I'm speaking about Africa in the full knowledge that Africa is diverse, that Africa has different hands at play, that Africa, African countries have different historical experiences, that the British still want to be here, the Portuguese want to be here, the Belgians want to be here, the Americans, of course, want to be here, the Chinese want to be here, the Turks want to be here. Everybody wants to be here. But France is a lot more desperate. Desperate because historically she has retained a stranglehold on her former colonies, the 14 of them, and she has retained that stranglehold through economics so that even their economies and their currencies are denominated on the basis of what France says. Their resources are controlled from France. Their resources are exploited by the French. And therefore, what we see as a rebellion or a revolution in countries such as Guinea, such as Mali, such as Niger, such as Burkina Faso, if they are handled well, they are the beginning of a new wave of thinking, which is sending a clear message to the colonizer turned neo-colonizer that African countries now want to reorganize their governance in a manner that responds to the reality of their situations, in a manner that will enable them to be in charge of their economies in a manner that will ensure that they are no longer satellite states. But that only depends on how those administrations midwife the transition between the military takeovers into the next phase where there'll be people participation. And it's not going to be easy because countries like France never say die. They are going to fight. They are going to ensure that the process of, uh, of transition is not easy. They are going to have fifth columnists within those administrations trying to torpedo whatever good thing that is designed to happen. And it is incumbent upon African countries to therefore wake up and in a manner of speaking, smell the coffee to use that cliche and slang and know that the sooner we embrace these changes, the safer Africa is. And I'm happy that of course, uh, ECOWAS uh, did backtrack and have now said they are lifting the sanctions on the countries that had been sanctioned after the military takeovers. And it was not lost on me that indeed the, on the 13th day of February, the former president of Nigeria, General Yakubu Gawon, who was one of the founders of ECOWAS, wrote to all the heads of state and said, please lift these sanctions, engage these people. And almost a week later, or even earlier, all the heads of state met in Abuja in Nigeria and the sanctions were lifted. And I hope that this is the kind of impetus that is going to gain traction so that Africa benefits positively from these changes. Remember, in many African countries, the ballot has been abused to the detriment of the people, and the people are yearning for genuine change. 
that will liberate them from the external colonizers and even the internal colonizers who are latter-day politicians who are using state resources to remain in power and to do the bidding of foreign powers. The story of Congo is the story of sadness. Because one remembers that in the 1950s, when Congo was still under the control of Belgium, the Belgians never intended to leave. And I read fondly in history when in 1958, the first prime minister of Congo, Patrice Emery Lumumba, was invited by Kwame Nkrumah to attend a conference in Accra. That invitation to Lumumba was never meant to take place. In fact, the person who had been invited was Joseph Kasavubu, who was to become the first president. And when they came back, Lumumba had now had a dalliance with other leaders such as Nkomo, such as Nkrumah and others, and he came back. And the agitation for independence started in earnest. So that when the Belgians decided to grant independence to Congo, it was in a style that was designed to ensure that it failed. And King Baudouin, who was the king of Belgium at that time, was disgusted on that day when Lumumba gave his famous speech that the history of the Congolese will be written by the Congolese themselves. And barely one year, nine months almost, after the independence had been granted, we saw what started to happen. What started to happen is they sowed the seeds of discord between Lumumba and Kasavubu. At that time, they had already recruited Joseph Desiree Mobutu to be an agent of the Belgians, and history now confirms that he was an agent of the CIA. They accused Lumumba of being a communist, and they even sowed the seeds of secession in Katanga and even in Kivu, and of course we know that Lumumba was arrested and ultimately executed. And the structure was designed in such a way that Congo would never be united because the resources in Congo are so much that nobody wants a united and orderly Congo. They want a Congo that is in disarray so that they can continue to exploit the resources of Congo. And we saw that during the kleptocratic regime of Mobutu Sese Seko, that is exactly what happened. And even when Kabila came in, the two Kabilas, nothing might change. So Congo remains uh, a scar on the conscience of Africa because she is so well endowed with resources, yet our people remain poor because external forces continue to control Congo. In fact, there is evidence to suggest that one of the busiest air spaces in the continent of Africa is Eastern Congo. They are mining Colton, they are mining cobalt, they are mining diamond, they are mining gold, they are mining rare earth, and they are latter-day entrants. It's not just the European powers. The Chinese are now there. The Americans have always been there since the 1940s, the 50s, and the Belgians are there, the French are there, and other independent miners, and Congo is therefore a complex environment, and that complexity has seen one of the major wars, what was described at that time as Africa's world war, when many forces from Africa came, and of course there was a lull, and then that disappeared, and we have seen once again that the forces of destruction and division are back again in Congo, and Congo is not at ease. One need only read the writings on this history in the famous works of Kwame Nkrumah, Challenge of the Congo, and you will understand that Congo is a country that is on the jaws of danger. Complex conflict. Complex because there are external players 
external players who now know or believe and have the strong conviction that a disorderly Congo is good. Because if you have conflict, and it's estimated that there are over 120 armed groups in Eastern Congo only, that tells you how complex it is. And these armed groups are financing the activities through illegal mining. It also must be understood that Congo, like most African countries, are victims of the arbitrary boundaries that were created in Berlin. People never remember this as often, that they, as, the, as, often as they should. But the conference, the conference that was held in Berlin in 1884 and 1885 was actually known as the Congo Conference. It was at the behest of King Leopold of the Belgians to deal with the question of Congo. Uh, and, and that is how the petition then came about in order to give people spheres of influence so that the European powers would not fight one another as they extracted things from uh, the Congolese people. Now, why do I say it is complex? And why do I say that the boundaries are also part of the problem? Because of the arbitrariness with which the boundaries were drawn, you now find different ethnicities across borders. Take, for example, Rwanda and Urundi, what was known as Rwanda and Urundi. You find people who were described as Tutsis and Hutus. And you find also a large population of the Hutu or Tutsis, sometimes referred to as the Banyamulenge, who are in Congo, so that they are Congolese. They are, not, they are not Rwandese on the basis of the boundaries that we have. Nyerere, the former president of Tanzania, actually during the early days in 1970, when he was asked to mediate, said, when we talk about the Tutsi in Congo, they are not Rwandese, they are Congolese, according to the boundaries that we inherited. And for that reason, it is incumbent upon the governments and administrations in Congo to treat them as Congolese. The fact that they have their kith and kin in Burundi and in Rwanda does not make them Rwandese or Burundians. And he made this example, he gave this example. For example, the Maasai in Kenya and the Maasai in Tanzania, they are Maasais, but they are those who by dint of the boundaries are now Kenyans and other Tanzanians. And that is yet another conflict. It is a conflict which has given birth to what is now known as the M23. The M23 are people of Tutsi origin who are Congolese. But they are now being told, no, you are not Congolese, you are Rwandese, and that is why you see the frequent accusations that the Rwandese government is supporting them. And the frequent denials by the Rwandese administration that they are not supporting them. The other conflict that has emerged in Congo is that Congo has become what one may say a rare ground for fighting groups from Uganda. The ADF, when they were expelled by the current NRM regime, went into the forest in Congo. You remember that even uh, Joseph Kony at one time went to Central Africa through Congo. We, there is also evidence to suggest that there are Burundian fighters, rebels also in Congo in those thick forests. So it is a combination of factors, local factors, commercial reasons by illegal miners, foreign hands which want to ensure that Congo remained the way it is, local politicians who benefit from a disorganized and disorderly and conflict-ridden Congo, all these factors conjoined create what is essentially a state of confusion which needs resolution by the entire continent of Africa. Unfortunately, Africa has not handled this matter well. In the early days, we had uh, not early to mean 
maybe two, three years ago, we had Jean Lorenzo, the president of, uh, of Angola, being the mediator, and Sadak was then very much involved. They even had their forces. Then the Shishekedi government brought in the East African forces and once again got dissatisfied. They are now back to the Sadak forces. That tells you the kind of confusion that there is. I have myself several times suggested to some of the individuals that I know that are former heads of states and government to come in as the elder statesmen and women of Africa and have an all Congolese conference during which all the combatants would be involved and they decide how to govern Congo and how to ensure that there is sustainable peace in Congo. Easier said than done, but necessary and urgent. <laughs> Not easy. Because when your government is in Kinshasa and you are talking about a country which is the size of Western Europe, the infrastructure is poor, you cannot be in effective control of the country. So the president can say what he is saying in Kinshasa, but the people in Goma can ignore him. The people in Katanga can ignore him because the territory is so big, the people are so divided, the interests are so diverse that it will take a combined effort of all Africans of goodwill to give them the ability to deal with the problem as it is. As it is now, it is not possible. They just don't have the resources, they don't have the personnel, and they don't have the, in my view, even the ability to pacify Congo if it is left to them. It's one that is not desirable at all. It is an undesirable conflict, but it would be a conflict that would bring in quite a number of neighbors if, if such a conflict were to take place. And, and let, let, let people not be cheated. And President Kagame has been on record as saying that uh, we don't want any conflict, but if it is brought on us, then we are going to defend ourselves to the last person. And that is exactly what is going to happen. The assumption that Rwanda is a little country that you can overwhelm in a few days is completely misguided. And, and I hope that the administration in Kinshasa remains conscious of this, that Africa does not need a conflict of that nature. As I've already indicated, there are over 120 armed groups in that area all of which have different commands. So what you'd be bringing forth if there was a conflict of that kind would be chaos. It would be hell on earth. People would create an environment where they would just control little fiefdoms where they mine and engage in illicit trade, which is completely undesirable. And remember that there are people within these territories who also would be acting at the behest of foreign powers. And I'm happy to hear that President Shishekedi has now said uh, that he is prepared to meet President Kagame. There was a time when he said he was not going to meet President Kagame, but wisdom is going to prevail. And I hope that in the next few weeks, there will be such a meeting between President Shishekedi and President Paul Kagame, and that the tension would be eased and that we would have uh, rapprochement and we would have a peaceful resolution to all the issues that are outstanding, if any, between uh, Democratic Republic of Congo and Rwanda. If I were to set out the agenda for President Shishekiti and uh, President Kagame, I would say, number one, let us uh, discuss good neighborliness, let us discuss peace, and let us discuss the fate of the Congolese who are being said to be Rwandese. Recognize them as Congolese and give them their right to stay in peace in Congo. And once you've done that, let us then disarm all the combatants and let them be integrated in the forces of Congo 
either through in the military or through policing, and let us have a joint commission which will monitor the situation between Congo and Rwanda at the border. Once you do that, then I believe that the other issues can then be discussed and discussed effectively. It's, it's a combination of both. You cannot ignore, uh, when, when, when a mosquito is, is, is biting an elephant, the elephant must be concerned both about the mosquito and the pack of lions that want to attack. So the internal fighters would be the mosquito, but they are very irritating and very dangerous, and they can ensure that you can't even operate. The pack of lions are the foreign powers, and they come under different guises. They come under uh, uh, European Union, Chinese and all they want is, are the resources. They'll give you a pittance and they think and make you believe that you are being taken care of. So I think it must be a multi-track approach. Enter into arrangements with those foreign powers that are mutually beneficial so that if the Congolese want to engage with the European Union or the Americans or the Turks or the Russians, it must be on the basis of mutual benefit. And internally, you must also create an environment that is going to ensure that trade can be undertaken in a proper manner so that you don't have conflicts which undermine the environment and poison the environment in which you want trade to be undertaken. So that can be done. These are things that can be done simultaneously. And I believe that a government that is convicted, a government that is clear in what its mandate is and what its goals are, can achieve all these. It has been done before, and I see no reason why it cannot be done in the Congolese situation, the complexities and the history notwithstanding.